everybody. Uh, my name is Ravi. I am here to make a short and sweet presentation, well at least short if not sweet, <laughs> on quality of service in Gluster. Uh, so the initial talk that I submitted to was uh, to talk about throttling in Gluster. Uh, but even as I was working on the solution, there were set of new requirements that came in and the idea kind of morphed into something bigger than just throttling. So let's look at the agenda for the talk. So we'll be looking at four things, three things rather. Uh, first, what is the need for a quality of service uh, in Gluster? And what were the approaches that we took initially based on the requirements that we had initially? <coughs> Then I'll talk about how the problem scope got changed uh, and how uh, throttling for uh, uh, FOPs became something bigger into quality of service for cluster. And then we'll have a, probably, if time permits, have an open floor discussion on what your thoughts are. Okay, so why do we need quality of service? Uh, so the initial problem that we faced uh, was mainly due to uh, the cell field demand traffic in replicate volumes. Uh, so uh, there was a common problem, there has been a common problem among users uh, on the mailing list complaining that the cell field demand takes a lot of CPU and IO cycles when doing cell fields. So these can up occur usually in three cases when one of the breaks of a replica is down for a long period of time and there's a lot of data that's to be written and when the break comes up, you end up sinking uh, a lot of resources. Uh, then there is the replace brick scenario where uh, a brick goes down and go, goes dead so you can't bring it up again so you'll have to do a replace brick in which case the entire contents of the uh, replica has to be synced from one brick, the good copy to the other brick and the not so occasional uh, use of uh, healful command. So uh, normally self heal demon uses uh, indices to keep track of what files to heal. Uh, but if that is not available, you also have the option of running heal full where it just crawls the file system from the top of the volume. Uh, every replica does uh, crawl from its point of view and then uh, compares the contents of the uh, files in the replicas and heals it. So in all these cases, uh, uh, both the source bricks and the sync bricks are bombarded with uh, FOPs, uh, mainly lookups, the inode LKs, entry LKs, uh, reads and writes and if you are using a diff algorithm for self field it also uses the ArchXM. Uh, so we have a lot of uh, complaints, like I said, I like to call it CCCs all over the internet. Uh, I call them chronologically chronic complaints because I started working on AFR in 2013, but I saw complaints as early as 2012 going down all the way recently about users who are complaining that the self field demand takes a lot of uh, CPU and IO cycles. Yeah, so uh, there are a couple of solutions that are already there in Gluster that we tried to solve this problem with. The first one was least priority queues. So the IO threads <coughs> translator has uh, a way of assigning uh, priority to the FOPs uh, based on the type of FOP that comes and also based on the client PID. So you can have different priorities for uh, creates, MKDS, so basically all the FOPs and if it is coming from a client like the self-field demand, then you can, assume, uh, you can assign a lower priority to such FOP. So this kind of an approach works well, mostly. Uh, I think it's even used by Facebook with some tweaking. So uh, I think Shreyas replied on the mailing list about how they use it. So what they do, I think, is have a configuration file uh, for storing. They basically calculate uh, how many number of IOPS are there coming from each client and then store it uh, in the config file and in the iothreads translator they do a moving window average of uh, the FOPs that are coming in and if it exceeds the value stored in the config file then they simply move it to a lower priority FOP. So uh, this should work in practice but there are some cons to it. Uh, so the main problem is the priority inversion. Uh, so what happens is that uh, uh, all the FOPs that are coming from self field demand when we put it into a lower priority queue uh, if, if the self-field demon also takes inode locks and entry locks to do self-field, at the same time the client that is writing to the file also takes these locks, uh, it will eventually end up waiting until the self-field demon releases the lock so that it can do the I.O. But because the self-field demon is of lower priority, these uh, FOPs never get or the unlock FOPs never get called and so there is a kind of a deadlock kind of a scenario. This is one of the disadvantages. And the other one is that if all the FOPs are there from self-field demand only and assume there are no client IOs that are happening, 
uh, then the least priority solution does not uh, really work in the sense that if there are no other clients that are sending FOPs and you don't need to schedule anything else other than the self field demand traffic, if you put everything in a low priority queue, then that still does not uh, solve, you know, solve uh, does not prevent the consumption of CPU cycles because all the FOPs that are there in the queue are only self field demands and they eventually end up consuming cycles of CPU and memory. So this was the first approach that was there that we took. The second approach that uh, we tried to explore was the token bucket, uh, token bucket filter algorithm. So the TBF is widely used in uh, a, a variety of resources like C groups and other uh, network traffic shaping uh, uh, solutions. So the token bucket filter uh, is like a rather simple solution. Uh, it's rather easy to understand. So we have uh, buckets which are filled with tokens at a given rate. This can be tweaked and then you have requests that are coming in. Uh, so each request or FOP needs a certain amount of tokens to be processed. So uh, for example, you can assign weights saying read FOPs need X tokens or write FOPs need Y tokens. And if, it, if, if a FOP comes to the queue and uh, each FOP actually consumes those tokens from the bucket. So if a read FOP requests X tokens, it will try to take as many tokens, X number of tokens from the bucket and if it's not already there, if it is able to uh, gather as much tokens, it will allow the FOP to go through. But uh, if it is not there, then it will have to be put in a queue until uh, the bucket gets filled with enough number of tokens and subsequently uh, we are having enough number of tokens to process the FOP. Right. Uh, so, there is already an infrastructure available in Gluster for TBF. Uh, I think Bitrot uses it uh, for calculation of arch XMs uh, for files, for signatures of the uh, data files. Uh, so, uh, the TBF algorithm in Gluster is more on a per FOP basis. Uh, it is not on a client basis. So, you just instantiate one uh, instance of the token bucket filter and it will give you as many buckets as there are number of FOPs there. Uh, so, what I tried to do was uh, put uh, a translator. So, this is currently in libglusterfs. So, I tried to make a separate translator uh, which will be residing above IO threads and uh, I instantiated buckets only for mainly the self-field demon self FOPs which are inode LKs, entry LKs and read this. Uh, so, this is, this is the easy part. So, what was difficult was assigning uh, tunables to these uh, FOPs. So, uh, without any actual workloads, it is not uh, possible to like hard code values into what is the number of tokens that are required to be filled. So, uh, that was the difficult part and it is actually the difficult part in implementing a common solution which is using uh, token bucket filters. So, uh, so uh, as I was working on this problem, the scope of the problem got bigger and uh, we got into multi-tenancy, uh, so which is why I kind of stopped working on it uh, previously, which is why I stuck out the in-progress part in the TBF. So, multi-tenancy, uh, what exactly is multi-tenancy and how is it related to QoS? So, multi-tenancy is something where you have a single cluster volume, uh, but you have multiple tenants inside them. Uh, they are analogous to like home directories inside Gluster. So, each tenant is like a home directory inside Gluster and users can access it from multiple clients. So, there can be multiple clients accessing a single tenant and uh, uh, such multiple such tenants can exist in the volume. Uh, so, there are other ways to do it like using separate volumes for uh, each tenant, but that does not really make sense because uh, you really don't want to carve out separate bricks every time you want to add a tenant uh, into a volume. And it with multi-tenancy features, you also have better granularity in the sense that if you want just a 100 GB tenant, you can easily get it out of a single volume. If you want a 1 TB tenant also, you can use the same volume to carve out the tenant for it. So, uh, quality of service, in ha it has to become like a first class citizen in Gluster because more and more people are asking for it. but what exactly do we want with it? So, uh, so there are a couple of things that uh, multi-tenancy has to take care. One is the noisy neighbor problem, which is similar to the self-field demon problem in the sense that uh, all the traffic from one particular client should not be affecting or take away the bandwidth from other clients. 
uh, and we also need the second pro the second solution that we need to give is uh, guaranteed IOPS uh, and throughput guarantees. So if somebody says that I am a gold member, I want X uh, bandwidth, then he has to be guaranteed that much amount. If somebody is like a silver member or a bronze member, then he has to be given a lesser priority. And it also has to work on multiple platforms, meaning the solution that we choose ideally should be based within cluster and like so that it becomes easy to work on things like NetBSD. For example, uh, if you just try to use cgroups, then it becomes a Linux specific thing. Yeah, so what can be done with today's infra? So to, for achieving multi-tenancy with uh, what we have in cluster today, uh, so any solution involving multi-tenancy requires three aspects. One is uh, a subdirectory mounts feature, which means that uh, you will use the same cluster volume to host multiple tenants and the other requirement is that each tenant requires a quota enforcement so that it will not consume more number of space than what it is set and the third one is providing a security for these tenants meaning if you one tenant if, if a client logs into a tenant he should not be able to like cd dot dot or if he knows the gfid you shouldn't be able to access files which are outside the tenant so the uh, the first requirement of quota enforcement is already there in cluster. We already have the bits to support quota. quota. Uh, subdirectory mounts, uh, there has already been a patch upstream which uh, allows uh, subdirectory mounts using fuse. I think Pranith is working on it. It was sent by Avati initially. Yeah, so that is the second requirement. The third one is providing uh, security for subdirectory mounts. Uh, so the security feature means that if you mount a subfolder inside a volume, uh, so in cluster what happens is that if you have the GFID, you can access the file uh, pretty much without knowing anything else. So uh, if you are mounting, suppose there is a volume and there are two tenants, say, uh, I don't know, so tenant 1 and tenant 2, for lack of better words, uh, and if somebody mounts, has access to tenant 1 and mounts that share, and if he tries to access a file which is in tenant 2 using the GFID, that should not be allowed. So currently most of the uh, translators in uh, cluster are also client side. They are not specific to the server alone. So when you say that these translators are easily hackable by somebody, uh, so that gives them a chance. So uh, you also have GF API based clients in cluster, right? So there's nothing that's stopping you from writing a client uh, which uh, using the ex external in existing uh, translators like DHT uh, which have uh, in which you can write a program to uh, access a file by just uh, having a GFID of the file. So uh, what we need to prevent that is to have some kind of a solution which will allow only access for that particular tenant. So if you are trying to access a file with another GFID which is outside your scope you should not be uh, allowed to do that. Uh, so the way we do it is uh, have some kind of a tag that is associated to each tenant inside the volume. So you have say tenant 1 and tenant 2, you associate a tag to tenant 1 and all the files in, inside the tenant 1. So basically the entire hierarchy inside that. And when you are trying to mount a volume, you also have uh, the existing mechanism of auth allow and auth reject. So you say that I will be able to access only these particular uh, tenants in which Gluster D has given me authorization. So that is the first level of security using auth allow and auth reject. Uh, once you have mounted the tenant using that, and if you still have the GFID, if you, yep. Why not just use uh, PGFIDs to kind of trace back the actual directory? Uh, but what about if, if the PGFID is also outside the uh, tenant that you have? In which case you still want to block that?
think you want to say something. Yeah, uh, I have a question for Ravi and even for others. So, this point comes up again and again. Uh, once the client is authorized, authenticated and authorized, can we just have our designs on the, based on the trust that the binary or the translator <coughs> is trustable or do we always have to account for a text letter which is handwritten by the user and can do something magic here? Even if it is authorized, so they would anyhow come with SSL. So you have no. I mean, the mount itself would not have succeeded. And once the mount has succeeded, can we just trust that? No, no, no. So, so the problem is here if you give access to only one subdirectory, it can still go open there on all zeros and ones and start browsing the whole. Yes, but to do that, they will have to change the code. They cannot do it from yeah, the application. Yeah, nothing is stopping them. So that is what we are trying to prevent actually. Even if they have access to the code and they write something hacky, we should not be allowing access to them. True, but on a good setup, the admin would have ensured that the SSL key is never passed on to them. So the design has to always account for... Yeah, so, so the tag feature is that basically if you try to access a file with a GFID which is not tagged to that particular tag, then you deny the access. Yeah, so these are the things that can be done with today's infra. Uh, so the whole solution of quality of service in Gluster is still in its inception. So we don't have concrete answers as to how we can throttle both clients, self-field demons and provide uh, multi-tenancy. Uh, so we initially had a look at C groups. Uh, so C groups works well for the self field daemon use case where SSD is consuming a lot of resources because you can just pin it down to consume only x x amount of resources. But uh, so and we also have users and we also have users in the community who have tried uh, C groups with cluster SSD and you know successfully said that they are able to cap the resources. Uh, but uh, I don't think uh, there are existing APIs in C groups which can uh, actually help you in making it. Uh, understand what Gluster is doing. So you can control the whole process as such, but you cannot assign like priorities to what is happening inside the Gluster process. Uh, so uh, even if, if you have some sort of an API uh, which cgroups provides, but uh, it doesn't provide it. So even I think uh, the maintainer of cgroups has said that uh, cgroups is best for like system admin point of view, but if an application logic wants to use that cgroups for throttling mechanism, it shouldn't be the uh, best thing to do. Uh, so the other thing that we explored is uh, using uh, TBF for tenants. Uh, so the existing code in libglusterfs is like I said in my earlier slide, it's on a per fob basis. Uh, we will have to modify it to make it uh, work on a per client basis. Uh, but even there, uh, the main challenge is to decide on the tunables uh, because it's not easy to provide uh, or at least using the current gluster infrastructure doing, doing a volume set every time you want to change a tunable uh, doesn't seem to be very amenable to you know tuning. So we'll have to expose some kind of a ProcFS entry or something like that to make it more uh, flexible. Uh, then you'll also have to think about how it will work with uh, brick multiplexing because uh, with brick multiplexing you only have one brick process and that is going to be serving multiple shares. Then how do you actually coordinate uh, which FOPs came from uh, the client and how do you regulate it by using TBF in that. So much of it is still in discussion. So uh, if you have any questions or comments or if you'd like to share how you have implemented some things, perhaps the Facebook guys have some inputs on how uh, we can use throttling or any other mechanism like IO threads. If it works well for you, we can probably have a talk on this offline. Have any questions? Yeah, so Right. 
See, a broken bucket filter actually helps in giving you the upper cut of uh, reservations, but it does not, like I think Jeff pointed out in an email that, so if, if you have a lot of ops coming in, then it can help you regulate it and smoothen it out. But if you want like a minimum guarantee, then that is not the solution to go for. Or at least PBF cannot handle such scenarios. I don't think minimum guarantee is something that you can do. Because the kind of people who are leaving one of the tenants to voting like continuously, all of the other tenants will anyway be affected. We can't stop it. Yeah, so the weakest link problem would still be there. Yeah, yeah. If you require it. So just to add to that, if you are going for lower guarantees, then what we can do is probably recommend hardware configuration where we say don't use disks, use SSD so that this problem can be mitigated to a certain extent. Yeah, no, so but the thing is, if we give the limits on uh, per uh, tenant basis, uh, we, we still can't give a lower bound because other uh, uh, other clients which are trying to do voting rights are not of the same, they will still affect the, uh, you know, I.O. from the other tenants who are not at all. Using the same, right. right. Sounds like a birds of a feather session. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Okay, you put it up there? Great. Okay. That was what I was hoping for. On the, on the PGFID one, I just want to follow up. It's like, 
so when we implement this, we actually like we have just a cap. So it's like expensive the first hit, but then it's cap. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you hit that PJFID, it's like big old one. You get it, and it's, it's cheap. So it's not like it's not as bad as what you might think. And, and, and like the cap is like, like hit, like the like a high hit. So you rarely use that. All right then. Thank you.